All right, we're going to get going again. Uh, one of the organizers was extremely worried about the fact that we're at slide 34, and in the file that you have, it goes up to 105 or something like that. So relax, I am not going to cover all of these slides, okay? This is a very modular talk. It's planned that way. I would much rather go through 45 slides slowly with lots of questions than run like a lunatic across, you know, 100 slide presentations. So no worries about that. Uh, so we're going to pick up, in some sense, where we left it, in the sense that we, you know, by running these large simulations, we've, we think that we've captured something of, uh, of dynamo action in the sun and sun-like stars, at least, stars that are not too different from the sun. Seems to work as well in stars that are more different from the sun. But the fact is that these simulations are really big. You know, it, it, hundreds of core years of computing time to get that. You've got terabytes of data that you have to move around. And uh, if you've uh, read you know, the books and stuff like that, models of the solar cycles have been around for a lot more than the last five years, right? So what we're going to do in the first part of the second lecture is go through you know, the more conventional, simpler approaches to the problem that are still dominating the literature. So you know, in terms of education, this is an important thing to do. Now, the basic idea is actually quite simple. Uh, I'm going to put this there, and we are going to. I will explain you in a very cartoon, simple fashion what is usually still to this day considered as the most, the most likely mechanism for producing large scale magnetic field out of small scale flows. For historical reasons, it's called the alpha effect. But even before it was called the alpha effect, this guy Parker came up with the basic idea so that. I am going to uh, select huh? the alpha effect. I have slides on this coming up, don't worry. I am going to pick volunteers, and I like your haircuts. So <laughs> it's, it's as good as a new criterion, right? It's not really a so <laughs> oh, I know all about that, don't worry. So, so, so no, these guys, not much for the time being, but you just okay. hold this end of the rope, and you go back a bit and hold this end of the rope. So a bit more. Not too much tension yet. <laughs> That's later. <laughs> OK, so suppose this is a magnetic field line. So this, is, this could be you know, like a, lar a big magnetic loop, a large scale field that runs along the whole sun. So it's a field that is structured on a large scale. Convection in the sun is influenced by rotation. What that means, you know, on the Earth, when you start to have these big upwellings, they turn into cyclones. They always turn in the same way. That's because the Coriolis force is getting a preferred sense of twists to upflows and downflows. The same thing happens in rotating stars because of rotation, because of the Coriolis force. Remember that in MHD, the current density is given by the curl of the magnetic field. So that's the right-hand rule business. So yeah, maybe in the, maybe in the front's going to work better. Now get over here. So like back to basic e and M, okay? If this is a wire with a current, right? You take your right hand, and if the current goes this way, you have a field that wraps around like that. That's the field induced by a rectilinear current. Now there's a really funky twist in MHD. In MHD, now imagine that this is now a magnetic field line. Do you remember from first year e and M how you make a uniform rectilinear field? Starts with S. Solenoid, exactly. So a series of current loops like this will produce a nice uniform field that way. So, in, so if you have, a, if you have a, magnetic, a uniform magnetic field, uniform on this scale here inside the sun, it's being driven by currents that are in planes perpendicular to that magnetic field line. Now, suppose that convection arrives and twists this like that. I'm twi no, no, not too much. So I'm making a twist. In, in this one direction by a quarter turn. So the field is going this way, this way. Now this is like a circular magnetic field line, right? The, the associate current density runs this way. This is perpendicular to the uh, currents that hold the uniform field. Now if these convective unfueling happen all the time all over the place, you add all of these together and what you end up with is a nice current density that is now running parallel to the magnetic field line. So out of a uniform field, using small scale cyclonic events, 
you've built a large scale current density that will then induce a field on much larger scales, on the same scales as that thing. So thank God or whoever you like for the superposition principle that holds with Maxwell's equation, right? We can add up all these little bits of induced field and build a large scale out of that. Except that there are a number of catches. Suppose that my cyclonic event arrives, does this, and then twists half a turn instead of a quarter. My current density is now going this way. Doesn't do me any good because I already have current going this way. If it goes three quarters of a turn, well, now my current density is going this way. So if this guy goes three quarters of a turn and this one goes a quarter, I've just induced two small bits of currents that cancel each other. All right, so the only way that you can get something coherent out of that is that everybody's got to agree to turn a quarter turn or something like that. Unlikely. Well, under what condition can this happen? There are three ways okay, where this is possible. We'll do all three of them. Now, this time you have to work. I need tension. OK? <laughs> I think I need more attention than that. Okay. <laughs> this, oh, this, this, oh, this is good. Now, suppose that the field is really intense, and this convective event comes in, right? Now, you know, I've, I've, I've done a lot of weightlifting in my life, but there's no way with these two guys pulling this way that I can, you know, make this loop I was doing before. Tension resists it. So in a situation, but this is not necessarily a bad thing. If I can just tension. If I can just twist a little bit, that little bit of twist right, still has a component of current going this way. But their tension is making sure that I'm never going to go beyond you know, a quarter turn or even an eighth of a turn. So in a situation where the strength of a large scale field is a lot larger than that of the small scale field, this process can work. Except that in the sun, there's much more energy in the small scale field than in the large scale one. So for sun and stars, this doesn't work. The other way that this could possibly work is if I'm in a situation where the coupling between, so the coupling between, less tension please, thank you. So that the tension between the flow and field is not so good. So if the coupling, not the tension, the coupling between the flow and field is not good, my magnetic Reynolds number is not a lot larger than one. Flux freezing is not holding very well. What that means is that whenever I try to do this, it slips. I twist a bit and it slips. But still, as long as I can get a little bit of a twist, then it works. So that process will function if the magnetic Reynolds number is a lot, well, is of order unity. Except that in the sun and stars, it's like 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. So this one is out the window as well. So we're down to the last option. Now, what I told you is that we get in trouble if this twist starts going you know, many, many ways around. And that's when things end up adding almost like a, like a random walk in some sense. One way to avoid that is if the lifetime of the convective upflows is quite short compared to their turnover time. That's called short coherence time turbulence. If these convective updrafts and downdrafts lose their identity really quick before they had a chance to do a full turn, then what happens is that this upflow comes around, whoop, a little bit of a twist goes away. This one comes around, whoop, 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 whoop like that. And the collective addition of all of this, because none of these guys was able to go more than, you know, not even a quarter turn, but none ever went a full turn or half a turn, at that point it still works. So by elimination, we can think that this process might work in the convection zone if the, con if the turbulence is so vigorous that the, it's, it loses its coherence really quick. A cyclone in the Earth's atmosphere, you know, this thing lives for weeks and weeks, right? So if you happen, hopefully not to be in there, you're going to spin around a couple of times before you finally drop somewhere. Right? So that, is long, that, that would be called a long coherence time you know, turbulence, if you want to call it that. So we want to be at the, in the other regime. We want to be in a regime where as soon as an, for, an upflow forms, it disappears and another one happens and another one happens. So under this circumstance, that works. Yes? If No, because you, you twist one way when you're going up, one way when you're going down. You need cyclonicity. You need a, a correlation between sense of twins and upflow and downflow. What Jeff is basically saying is that, well, you want to conserve mass. So every time you have an upflow, you have a downflow. So if I twist the same way when I go up and down, things cancel out. But the point being that 
what matters is what's called the flow helicity, the correlation between the helicity and the radial flow direction. And the Coriolis force does this the right way. Probably didn't make any sense, neither the question nor the answer. There's a symmetries and stuff like that. But that is basically the basic idea. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, we need to make math out of that to put it into a model. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that here relatively quickly because we are, in some sense, running out of time. And this is done very well in the chapter that Matthias Rimpel, who's here back there, wrote for Volume One. Okay, he's covered that topic in great detail in Chapter Three, I believe, of Volume One. So this is the twist I was mimicking or imitating. I have the wrong thing again. And the idea of that this twist takes place along these magnetic field lines all over and add up. And the, the, the addition of all these processes leads to a large scale current system that in this case can produce a magnetic component. Now, the way you, oh, well, oh. <laughs> that's why. Very confusing. We have two of these things. OK, that's fine. So mathematically, how you do this, and again, I, I, I realize I am going through this quickly, but again, it's done in all great details in the book. You separate your total flow and field into a large scale component and a small scale component. And that small scale is such that when you average it, that's what these brackets are. Think of a zonal average. These things go to zero. You take that and you plonk it into the induction equation. So every time you have dB dt, it becomes d dt of that thing plus d dt of that thing. And you average so that all these bits cancel out. What you end up with is a, uh, something that looks exactly like the induction equation you started with, except it's for mean quantities. We have the u cross b term. We have the dissipative term written differently here. This is the novelty. This is something that is related to the the cross of the small scale flow and the small scale B. Now, these might average to zero individually, but they don't necessarily average out to zero in their cross correlation. For some type of turbulent flow, they will. For others, maybe they don't. And this thing is the turbulent electromotive force. And that is the thing that mathematically captures the process we were mimicking in the front here with, them, with my piece of rope. Uh, now, the way you tend to do this the turbulent electromotive force is a vector. Uh, what I've shown you here is that I have a large scale magnetic field, right? That piece of rope. And I have these small scale events that produce this large scale current. The current is like producing a large scale electromotive force. So this, this electromotive, this, this thing that I'm writing here is a function of the mean field. I'm working on the mean field to twist this thing around. The mean field is a vector quantity. The electromotive force is a vector quantity. It's oriented in a certain way. And the mathem mathematical object that you need to link two vectors is a tensor. So we're going to link the electromotive force with the mean field through a tensor. And we're actually going to express, develop this as a sort of like a Taylor series expansion in terms of the mean field and its derivatives. And the point being that these, if you do it that way, these things should not depend on the mean field. And they can only depend on the statistics of the flow. Now, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on, that's an infinite series. The reason it's called the alpha effect is that we decided to use the Greek letter alpha for the first term of this expansion back in 1966, I believe. And astronomers being creatures of habit, you know, no one went to Cyrillic alphabet or anything like that in between. So this is now and forever known as the alpha effect, the first term in that infinite expansion that we usually truncate after the second term. So the first term looks this way. And if you have you know, isotropic, almost isotropic turbulence, then the tensor has to be isotropic. It ends up being a scalar. And uh, what this is basically expressing is that for turbulence like that, the mean electromotive force is actually parallel, because this is a scalar, to the mean magnetic field. And this is precisely what we were showing with the rope in front of you guys before. And that's, the, and that's what we were doing. That's the alpha effect. And you know. You can actually, by, uh, by various approximations that will hold, that are expected to hold for small coherence time turbulence, you can express that scalar in terms of the flow helicity, which is that thing, that being the correlation time of the turbulence. And what is, this is basically telling you is that the 
the source term, this turbulent electron motor force, is proportional to the flow helicity. And the flow helicity, or cyclonicity, is what is being driven by the Coriolis force. And this is why rotation is so crucial in this business. Without rotation, you don't have net flow helicity. And without net flow helicity, you don't have an alpha effect. And you can go further, you know, by making assumptions about the statistics of this, and you know, all of this is in the, is in the books. We can measure the alpha effect out of numerical simulations. There's various ways to do this, and you know, the results that you get for some simulations, anyway, actually fit not so badly with what these fairly simple analytical theories provide you. So, so there's really an alpha effect that changes sign, changes sign across the equator. That's a slice of the simulation. Rotation axis is like that. Equatorial plane this way, these are meters per second. That's the units of this alpha. And you know, the fact is, we can actually, in those simulations, measure a large scale alpha effect that kind of looks like what it's supposed to look like. And if I measure the flow helicity, you know, these things are, re this almost looks like the negative of that, which is what was predicted by this earlier expression. Now, you can separate, I, I, I go quickly through this because it's really getting kind of technical. Uh, you can separate the symmetric and anti-symmetric part of this alpha tensor. The anti-symmetric part you can write as a pseudo flow. So this is not a real flow. Okay? This thing is called turbulent pumping. If you put a drop of ink in the sun, you know, turbulent flow is not going to move the ink around. It's basically a part of the electromotive force that corresponds to displacing the large scale field. Mathematically, from the point of view of the mean field and the mean field only, it looks like a large scale flow, but it's really a turbulent effect. And that can be measured as well. I'll spare you the detail, but I'll just say that that thing, that flow speed that you, that turbulent flow speed that you can calculate out of the simulation is actually quite significant. It's measured in meters per second, which is a, com a speed comparable to other large scale flows that develop naturally in those simulations from thermal driving. So it's something that might play, that might play a role. Now you go to the next term, the, the term in, in that series expansion, the term that depends on the derivatives of the mean field. And again, under the same approximation, you can calculate that this thing ends up being proportional to the square of the turbulent intensity. This is the famous turbulent diffusion that some of you might have heard about. This, this is not good. This is actually destroying the magnetic field. It is creating small lane scale that enhance dissipation. There is no free lunch in this business. The same turbulence that gives you the alpha effect that you need is also giving you enhanced dissipation. Right? And that's, well, so you want to you wanna be in a situation where the source term that you get out of the alpha effect somehow does not get overpowered by the enhanced dissipation you get from the, from the next term in the development. So it's, not, it's, it's rather tricky. So that, this turbulent electromotive force that we mimicked you know, quite easily there with this piece of rope is actually a complicated beast. It induces field, the large scale field, it transports the large scale field by turbulent pumping, and it destroys the large scale field by turbulent diffusion. So it's actually a pretty tricky business. Uh, yeah, well, that's not too important. I've shown you this before. There is a, uh, another way that you can create, well, not create is not quite the right word. There is another way where you can take small scale field and build up a large scale component, this famous you know, self-organization I was talking about. That's the surface magnetogram we were looking at before. Notice these streaks that start from active region latitudes and extend all the way to the poles. Right? These are sunspots and active regions that are decaying. Sunspots are strong concentrations of magnetic field, and as they decay, they release magnetic field into the solar photosphere. And surface convection and poleward large-scale flows carry this field to high latitudes, you know, and this magnetic field accumulates in polar regions. So this is a process that takes stuff on very small scales and through this process of transport, diffusion, and accumulation builds up a large scale dipole moment. This is yet another way to go from small scales to large scales. And it certainly seems to be happening in the sun. Now, what's, what's interesting if you put numbers into that, I mean, just some observations, the total flux that emerges in one activity cycle is of order 10 to the 17 Weber. That's the SI equivalent of Maxwell's up to a factor of 10 to the five, I think. The peak polar cap flux 
is about 10 to the 14 Weber, three orders of magnitude smaller. So what that means is that if you can somehow tap into that small scale stuff and only manage to convert 0.1% of it into something coherent, you have enough flux to reverse the dipole of the surface dipole of the sun to create a large scale component that is you know, comparable to what we see. So that is yet another form of, uh, of going from small scales to large scales. That's a surface simulation of this process. So we're showing you, you know, this is supposed to be positive and negative magnetic fields. So this is a pair of sunspots. And we let this stuff you know, be carried by surface differential rotation, meridional flow, diffusion. So the stuff diffuses away, wraps around, and slowly but surely, you build up a large scale dipole moment. And if you take observed sunspot emergences and put them in a model like that, you can produce you know, surface magnetograms, synoptic, that look an awful lot like what you see. So what this is basically saying is that this process is very, is very likely, it is taking place at the solar surface. We understand it, we can model it, and the outstanding question is, is this dipole just a side effect of the fact that we have sunspots emerging, or is it feeding back into the dynamo loop? And the answer to that is, at this point, we don't know. There are people who would swear you know, that this is a key part of the dynamo, and others wouldn't even consider it. It's a very sobering thought to think that even with the sun that we can observe in such you know, great glory detail, we still don't really understand what the dynamo process is and whether things that we can observe are just a side effect or an important aspect of the dynamo. Now, again, at that level, numerical simulations are on the way of helping us. It's a fairly recent development that out of these, the types of numerical simulations that I was showing you, uh, we are reaching spatial resolutions and turbulent intensity levels such that this is, this is a cutout. The sphere is like that. This is the inside of a simulation. And these are basically magnetic field lines within convecting layers. The rotation axis runs this way. So this is basically a large scale structure that is being built by convection. Uh, very turbulent, as you can see. And that large scale structure has developed these loops. These loops that start you know, rising to the surface and even though there is not really a surface in the simulation, these things are exactly what we think would eventually produce sunspots. So we are slowly getting to the point where even with miracle simulations, we might be able to capture that process and answer that question, whether it's a side effect of the dynamo or an important part of the dynamo. Uh, what I want to spend the remaining 15, 20 minutes doing, that's the time we have left, is to try to look at how we take now these various simplifications of, of these dynamo processes and build them into a model that can actually be run you know, without waiting months to get results and without having to deal with terabytes of data. The types of simple dynamo models that I will describe here are precisely the ones that you will be working with in the lab part this afternoon. So we're kind of, you might say we're already you know, in, in the lab session here. We're starting to uh, to look into what you'll be doing in the lab. So remember, we started there. So what we will do, we'll go back to using only this equation. And what we'll do is for you, the, the, the thing that does all the work, we'll do two things. We'll input our steady artificial flows that we'll, des we'll design them to look like the, the large scale flows we observe in the sun. And for the small scale component of that thing, we will use this alpha effect and this mean field theory to specify source terms that will capture the effect of these small scales. Okay, so this is, a, this is a kinematic model. I specify the flows and I just solve this equation and look at what happens. We will do it, we will do a geometrical simplification as well. We will take the total magnetic field uh, we'll, and we'll decide that we will only solve for the axisymmetric component. We're not going to care about all the small scale field. What we want to get at is the dipole. It's the deep toroidal flux system that gives us sunspots. Nothing that depends on the azimutal angle. So my magnetic field, which is normally a function of all three space coordinates and time, is now a function only of depth and of latitude or polar angle, whatever you like, and time. Mathematically, you can express a field like that as the curl of a vector potential that only has a phi component plus the phi component of the magnetic field. You can do something similar with the large scale flow. 
And if you do that, uh, that's a, you can actually, by substituting that separation into the induction equation and doing a fair amount of vector algebra, you can end up separating your induction equation into two evolution equations for that poloidal vector, toroidal vector potential and toroidal magnetic field. The solutions that you will be working with in the lab are solutions of these equations. Right? This is what you'll be working with. Now, what is missing here that, it, that does not come out of this procedure is a source term in the poloidal field equation. This is where this alpha effect business comes in. This does not, right, the, the, this twisting, you know, if I decide that nothing depends on azimuth, you know, this twisting I cannot represent in there because the fact of taking a field line that is aligned in the zonal direction and twisting it, that introduces a zonal variation, right? By the very design of this model, I'm throwing this out from the beginning. So I need to come back and add this stuff artificially there. Now, I do have the shear of differential rotation. That is a very important component in uh, these models. This basically takes the poloidal field, so that's magnetic field lines that are in meridional planes, and it stretches them in the zonal direction. This is one important part of the dynamo loop in these models. So for that, this is a parametric expression that basically produces contours of angular velocity that looks qualitatively like the sun. Rapidly rotating equator, slowly rotating pole, and a shear layer straddling the base of the convection zone. So this is a parameterization that is used in the models that you will be working with. And if you take a dipole, and you let it shear by such a differential rotation, you get a toroidal field that is anti-symmetric about the equator, which is what observations tend to, tend to indicate. So this is basically an important part of the dynamo process in the model that you'll be using. Now, we also have this large-scale flow. UP is a flow in meridional plane. This is also observed in the sun. And we will just plonk in a big, nice single-cell flow. There are recent helioseismic observations that indicate that it's most likely more complicated than that. But believe me, the model you're working with is complicated enough already that we're going to stick to this, okay? just, just to see what happens. Now, that flow will carry magnetic fields at the surface. It, it runs like this, okay? anti-clockwise here. It will carry field to the high latitudes. We actually see that at the surface of the sun. And if you want to conserve mass, you need this flow that will bring things back uh, you know, back down along the base of the convection zone. That flow in the sun is driven by the turbulence. It's, a, it's again, uh, a product of turbulence. Now, these source terms we're going to consider, too. There's actually many possibilities that have been worked out. Uh, there's this alpha effect business we talked about, and there's this active region decay uh, mechanism, which is called the babcock layton mechanism for historical reasons. The two guys who worked on this developed this originally. And these are basically the only two source terms that we will put uh, into the model that we'll be using. Now, uh, 15 minutes? OK. So just to give you a bit of a preview of what you will see. Uh, we'll explain this later, but we'll put you in groups, and you, and you will all work on different versions of this model. Different versions means that some of you will use this alpha effect as a source term. Others will use the surface decay as a source term. Some of you will do models with meridional flows. Some will, will do model, models without. And at the end, we'll come together and try to see what comes out of all this. That's the idea. So I want to rapidly, in my remaining 10, 15 minutes, give you a few examples of some of the solutions you'll be working with. I'll show you what they look like uh, so that you have a bit of an idea what to look for when you start you know, doing the lab. Uh, the first thing that we'll do, these are our driving equations. Inside the numerical code that, that has produced the solutions you'll be using, we are basically using non-dimensional units. And there are these various dimensionless quantities that will appear. The detail of this is not important, but these are the knobs that govern the behavior of the solution. This guy measures the strength of the alpha effect. This one measures the strength of the differential rotation. This guy measures the strength of the meridional flow. And in a few models, there's actually a fourth one that will measure the strength of that turbulent pumping flow I was telling you about. OK, so you will, you will see these, these guys appear. Now, I'll skip that. 
this is one model that, that's about half the models that you will be using uh, in the database are basically based on retaining the alpha effect only in this equation and retaining differential rotation in this. The alpha effect can make contributions to this equation as well. We've thrown it out. Details don't matter. Uh, now, if you make a model like that, you can run it in different ways. I will just show you an example of, uh, uh, of what happens when you write these solutions as eigen solutions. None of the, the flow is time independent. Everything is time independent in the coefficients of the PDEs. And therefore, you can look for eigen solutions where this thing you know, is the eigenvalue. That's a growth rate. That's a frequency. So for that model, if you, if you solve this as an eigenvalue problem and you increase the strength of the alpha effect, that this thing, that's this thing here, what you find is that if the, grow, if the alpha effect becomes too weak, the growth rate, that sigma, is negative. So if, if you put a negative in there, it means that this thing decays exponentially. So this is a star that is not convecting hard enough or rotating quick enough to be a dynamo. There's a certain threshold you have to reach before this thing can be a dynamo, before induction can be dissipation. That's actually characteristic of all these models. The other thing that you see here is that the frequency keeps increasing with, with that, uh, that dynamo number for these linear models. On, which what that means is that if you get cyclic solutions, so you have, a, uh, you have a real frequency here, if you get a cyclic solution, the harder you convect, you know, the, the faster this thing will cycle. This is kind of cool because, again, we see stars at different rotation rates that have different dynamo periods. It looks like this. The solution database that you have contains not only the numerical solution that you will analyze, but also animations of these solutions. So you get a bit of a feel for what these things look like. And that's the animations that are in there. So this is the rotation axis. This is the equatorial plane. Above the dashed line is the convection zone. This is a stable layer. There's a color. The, the solid colors back there measure the intensity of the zonal field, of the toroidal field. And these lines, uh, clockwise like this, no, uh, clockwise like this in orange, counterclockwise in blue, that's the poloidal field. That's the part that's given by the toroidal vector potential. And that is just a toroidal component. So this is a snapshot. It doesn't look like much. But as we look at the time evolution of these things, it becomes more interesting. Not only is the field reversing polarity, but it, has a, it is moving. You know, the, these, these solutions, it's not just like the Earth's dipole that stays more or less, with all due respect to people who model this, it's of course a lot more complicated. But to a first approximation, the Earth's dipole is almost aligned with the rotation axis. And then every once in a while, ploop, within a few hundred years, it flips. This stuff not only changes polarity, but propagates spatially. And you will see things like that in the solutions that you will be looking at. And this is good because we do see sunspots appearing closer and closer to the equator in the course of the solar cycle. So these dynamo waves, as they are called, were the big success in the late 50s of the first attempts to model the turbulent electromotive force because they could explain the observed equatorial migration of the sunspots. That's a butterfly diagram. What we've done here is uh, we've taken images of the sun. And in strips of latitude, we've computed the percent of the surface area covered by spots. So this is basically tracing over 140 years where sunspots have emerged in the course of the various cycles covered by this diagram. And early in the cycle, sunspots emerge at high latitudes. And as you advance in the cycle, they get closer and closer to the equator until they show up again at high latitude. That behavior can be at least qualitatively reproduced by these uh, mean field dynamos. So these are the two solutions we were looking at before with one that ran out of gas for some reason. And what I've done here is I've, again, taken that solution. Oh, there we, there we go. OK. Magic uh, laser. Magic laser here. So we've, made, we've extracted the toroidal field at this depth and made the usual time, la uh, time latitude diagram. And you see the sequitorward propagation of the magnetic field. It's at too high latitude. Okay, but it's at least going the right way. This one is not only stuck at high latitude, North Pole uh, equator here, but it's propagating the wrong way. Okay, so 
This can make dynamo waves, but the waves don't always go the same way. It depends on how you set up the parameters in the model. Uh, we'll skip that. We'll skip that. We'll skip that as well. This is now changing the latitudinal dependency of this famous source term. So it's the same sort of thing we were looking at before, except obviously here you see something entirely different. You no longer have a nice dynamo wave, but you have a much more complex type of behavior where you seem to have, especially on this one, this was supposed to run in a loop. You seem to have two cycles, one starting here going this way, one starting there going that way, right? If you look at this thing carefully enough, that is a consequence of the shape of the differential rotation inside the sun. There are many shear regions. You have a rotation decreasing radially outwards here, increasing radially outwards there, and you have a latitudinal shear across the convection zone. Now, when you run these models, these shears all contribute to the production of magnetic field, but they do so in a manner that is almost independent from one shear region to the other. So you can get these strange, uh, you can get these strange uh, modulations. You can get multiple dynamo modes that will run simultaneously. This is now taking that same model that had the magnetic activity concentrated at high latitude, right? And now we've added this large scale flow that turns like this. And if you do that, you get an entirely different type of dynamo behavior, which is what this was supposed to show you. You can tell that the field is being brought here and dragged by the flow. This is no longer a dynamo wave. This is this treadmill, this conveyor belt, meridional flow that drags the field around. Some of you will be working with models of that variety you know, in, when we do the lab. So that's yet another dynamo model that produces polarity inversions. You know, and at that level of complexity is a decent model of the solar cycle. Except it's not always that easy. This is a whole sequence of these time latitude diagrams where I start with this solution that that's too high a latitude and I crank up the speed, that parameter you know, that drives the flow. First thing that happens, I kill everything. The dynamo dies. But if I keep turning, it reappears again, looking entirely different. This solution, which has a different source term for the alpha effect, turns into a steady field, a field that doesn't reverse polarity. That one goes totally bonkers. So what happens to these dynamo modes when you increase or decrease that flow is actually quite complex. And this is, again, something that some of you will explore in the lab. You'll take simple models like these and change various parameters, add various kinds of flows in there, and see what happens. This is a surface. This is what we, we would observe at the surface. So again, time latitude, North Pole equator. This is you know, in one solution I've picked. This is what the surface field evolution looks like when I don't have a meridional flow. And as I crack it up, you can tell that you can get entirely different behavior. This accumulation at high latitude is solar-like. This is not solar-like. So that's another thing you'll be looking for, you know, what happens at the surface. Now. Uh, you can also, I can go quick on that, you can run similar models where you concentrate the source term in the very outer layers of the model instead of being distributed across the convection zone. So that, these are, this is the equivalent in that framework of these models that rely on the decay of active regions to drive, drive the dynamo. And that just means a different source term. Again, details are not too important. All you need to know is that we, you now have a source term that is strongly concentrated in surface layers. And you can still make a model that looks, that looks pretty good, that reverses polarity, that has a period of something numbered in 5, 10, 15 years. So again, the flow, the, po the poloidal field, the field lines are being driven. It, they appear here. They get dragged to the pole. They get pulled down there. You, differential rotation induces this large scale field. And you get, again, a treadmill kind of dynamo where this time the source, uh, the source term is, uh, is completely different from the turbulent alpha effect. And you can still make a reasonable dynamo out of that. So this is the unfortunate situation we're in. That's just a basically, that's our butterfly diagram of sunspots. So again, you see a nice tendency to move towards the equator, except now it has nothing to do with dynamo waves. It's simply the, it's simply the passing, oh yeah, the meridional flow that drags this, and this is time, uh, time down there, latitude, north pole, equator. 
this is pretty solar-like in terms that you accumulate the surface field you know, in the polar caps. So these are the kinds of models that you will be playing with. And there is quite a debate right now in the uh, dynamo, solar dynamo modeling community about which of these two classes of model is best. You could argue that they're both equally too simplistic anyway, because they don't really do any dynamics. But in terms of you know, reproducing solar features, they both have you know, plus, pluses and minuses. Some do certain things quite well, and others do other things not so well. Uh, I will skip that. I think by now, I would rather uh, stop. We'll take a good 15 minute break, go to the bathroom, get some coffee. And when we come back, I will, uh, I will show you just a few more things on the screen, just explain you really uh, logistical aspects of using the various Dynamo codes that you will be using for the lab. That'll take maybe 10 minutes. And after that, Nick uh, and I will go around and try to make sure that you guys uh, can run the IDL analysis codes that you have. I will give you a little demo of what this will look like, and then we'll set you up to do it, and then we'll distribute the tasks, and then we'll be busy for an hour or so. Friend? I have a question. Yes. Yes. No, no, I mean, it's, it's a very good point. Uh, the geodynamo you heard about last week and what I've presented you, well, not, not in, the first, in the first lecture, the simulations, we are solving the same equations, the same partial differential equations. Our geometry is the same. We're both in a sphere. Okay? I mean, there's a way in which these things really look, really look the same. What, what is really different, I would say, are the parameter regimes, the intensity of turbulence that we're dealing with, the impact that the Coriolis force has uh, on the turbulence is very different in the sun than it is uh, in the Earth's interior. Uh, it's really, an, I would say it's really an issue of parameter regime. I don't know if you want to add something to that. Or. Scale heights, yeah. yeah. Stratification would be. Geodynamos. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, that's well, that's yeah, that's a parameter in some sense. Yeah, there's compositional driven convection in planetary interiors, which do not play a role here. No, there's a, there are some physical differences, but I, I think it's really the parameter regime of the rotation and the convection that, okay. that really are the, the key thing. We could try to set something up for the discussion session tomorrow afternoon, maybe. OK, good, yeah. Jeff? As long as you were showing all the lower boundary conditions for a basically stable core, yeah. uh, what did you remove that core? Capital sign is zero. So right. How does the model change? Uh, that is actually something that these guys will be exploring. Two of the tasks that will be assigned to two of the teams is to take this model and run it with different depths of the convection zone. So if, as long as you have a tachoc line, you get changes in cycle period and magnetic field intensity. If you start to have to go really, really deep down and you do not no longer have a tachoc line, then at that point, you might switch to a more purely turbulent dynamo, which then might become a steady dynamo rather than a cycling dynamo. That is what mean field theory used to predict, but that's not really borne out by, by simulations at this point. You do get irregular polarity reversals in simulations of fully convective stars. I mean, maybe not reversals, but oscillations and things like that. So the answer is we don't know. Yes?
Exactly. If, if star spot production takes place more or less like in the sun. I, I think there are observations of photometric variability where it looks like the rotation period of the star would be changing, which doesn't really make sense. And the interpretation is that the photometric variability you're seeing is due to spots. And if spots appear at different latitudes, when you catch them, you'll see a spot at low latitude. So you'll measure a rotation period that corresponds to this latitude. And if it's at higher latitude, you'll see something else. So people have actually claimed to have measured differential rotations in stars by exploiting that, that difference in that apparent difference in rotation rate that you get by doing photometric tracking of star spots. They've got like that in half a dozen stars, I think, by now, huh? Yeah. Yeah. We have a whole afternoon of question period tomorrow, so maybe we should. I don't know about you guys. I need a coffee badly. <laughs> so. But anyway, I'll be around afterwards as well after the lab. So anybody who has questions, we can continue this.